Why didn't the UK's latest aircraft carriers simply follow design cues from successful US designs? 1. Ian Smith, Answers What design cues are you referring to? Despite the complexity of a modern aircraft carrier it should be noted that they are all based upon a long history of Royal Navy innovations. First purpose-built aircraft carrier HMS Hermes Angled flight decks Steam catapults Ski ramps Use of jet aircraft The list probably goes on but I'm sure someone else will have covered this. The fundamental difference with U.S. carriers is dollar and nuclear power. At over $600 bn the U.S. defense budget is more than 12 times that of the U.K. at less than $50 bn. Quite frankly it needs to be in order for them to have the capability to project power by military means anywhere in the world without reliance upon allies. The single most effective means of doing this even after the advent of the cruise missile is to put your enemy within range of your air power and this can only be achieved with a carrier strike force. The US can achieve this quite easily due to the sheer size of their navy. The UK and by default the Royal Navy has neither the budget nor the inclination to do likewise and though HMS Queen Elizabeth and her sister ship Prince of Wales will be formidable vessels many analysts have pointed out that we really should have built a third ship to ensure continued capability during the cycles of maintenance and refits throughout their lives. Now as for the key difference in US carriers, and that French tub doesn't really count, nuclear. Well quite apart from the cost you should understand that a number of the allies that we rely upon in order to carry out naval operations on a global scale prohibit the use of nuclear-fueled vessels in their home waters and anchorages. The US on the other hand operate their own naval bases the world over. Katabar vs Ski Ramp Catapults whether steam-powered or MR mechanically complex systems which take up space and require additional resources on board ship to maintain and operate. Kunpao have been designed so as to achieve sortie generation rates that are close to those of the Nimitz and newer Ford-class supercarriers with a fraction of the manpower and without the need for M catapults which by the way are still having the wrinkles ironed out on board USS Gerald R. Ford. So basically. If we wanted US-style carriers with all the required support we'd need to sell the family silver but the fact remains that it was in fact the UK's Royal Navy which defined what a modern aircraft carrier is. 2. David Rischel, Answers It's not clear what cues from American designs your question is referring to. The UK did not want to build American-sized supercarriers, because this is not in line with the Royal Navy's mission. A carrier allows a robust and versatile projection of power. Just how much power you want to project dictates the capabilities of the carrier. The Royal Navy has no wish to project and sustain a force that can challenge a national air force, which an American carrier can. The Royal Navy wants to be able to provide area defense and to project enough power to conduct smaller expeditionary actions and to protect isolated national interests around the globe. The two carriers they are building will do this very well. It is also far better to have two smaller carriers than one big one because that gives you the capability to have one at sea and on duty almost all of the time. While France's carrier is a nice and capable ship, it was having problems with its engines when it was first deployed, I believe that it even lost a propeller from vibration, and it had to go back into the yards to get new propellers etc. The fact that the French only had the one carrier meant that they were completely without that capability when their carrier was broken. That won't happen with the UK's approach. There is also the question of money. Building an aircraft carrier is a lot like deciding to heat a large building by burning one pound notes, the expense just never ends. The cost of building the ship is almost incidental. Once you build it you have to maintain it and crew it and that crew needs constant training and practice. The carrier also needs aircraft, and those will end up costing as much as the ship and will be even more expensive to maintain. Taking off from, and landing on, a ship is a dangerous, difficult and terrifying feat and pilots and crews need to practice this a lot to be good at it, and that costs a lot of money. 
When the carrier goes out to sea, it can't go out alone and must be part of a task force of three to five other warships that will help escort and protect it, along with at least one submarine, and all of these ships and crews need to practice working with a carrier so they can get, and stay, good at their jobs. That costs lots of money too. Finally, keeping a carrier battle group at sea requires a lot of fuel, food and lots of spare parts at the ready, as well as the capability to get them to where the task force is operating, which is far more complex and difficult than you might imagine and which costs a lot of money. Doing all of this with two carriers that can each carry about 700 sailors and 40 aircraft is a pretty big commitment that the UK can afford. Doing this with two larger US-sized carriers that can each carry 2,600 sailors and 70-plus aircraft would probably not be economically sustainable for the RN, unless their mission was going to be to reconquer the Empire. So, I think the RN thought about all of this and built the carrier they needed to do the job they had in mind. They wisely are building two of them and, when these are operational, the RN will recapture some of its status as a leading world navy. 3. Robert Gardner, Answers U.S. designs are successful in certain aspects. Yes, they can carry a huge air wing and a significant combat load. They're also primitive and horribly inefficient, requiring a huge embarked crew. The Royal Navy cannot support a 5 to 6,000 person vessel. The USN have finally twigged to the fact that their carriers are monstrously expensive to operate and have started introducing significant automation in the Gerald Ford class carriers, reducing the embarked complement by several hundred personnel. The new RN carriers are designed in the tradition of the successful British designs, which have carried a smaller air wing and combat load than the USN designs but have nonetheless worked perfectly well when called upon for force projection, for example Falklands Conflict. They are simpler with no catapults, at the cost of a less diverse air wing, rotary wing and jump jets only, and build on a significant level of tried and tested automation, allowing a much smaller crew which generally makes the ship much easier and cheaper to run. Has a ship's company of 650 and total berthing capacity of 1,600 with air wing compared to 3,000 and 6,000 respectively on Nimitz. The inefficiency is highlighted in that Nimitz can, at most, run a little over twice as many aircraft as K, normal 40, max 50, but calls for three times as many crew to achieve that. 4. Jonathan Hickey, Answers Britain has built the largest aircraft carriers they can build in British shipyards, a design that they can afford to build and a design that they can afford to maintain over the lifetime of their service and they have built two of them for 2-3 RDS the cost of a single Ford class carrier. Not being nuclear powered makes their disposal at the end of their lives far less expensive than a nuclear powered vessel and there are also nations that will not allow a nuclear powered ship into their territory. In 2010 there was talk of building the Mezquit of our aircraft carriers that is a design able to operate catapult launched and arrestor wire recovered aircraft. However the electromagnetic catapult system that the US are going to use on the Ford class was well behind schedule and as the British carriers use gas turbine generators and not a steam plant they cannot without a major redesign use a steam catapult, there is no steam, so this along with the costs involved made the decision to build them as ski ramp launched, s, vtl recovered style layout ships a far simpler one. As for successful design cues. Many carrier queues were originally British but they have used the deck edge lift design that is common to US designs rather than the through deck designs that compromise hangar space traditionally used on British carriers, generally necessary as those ships were intended to be used in rough seas, but on a ship the size of the can pow no longer such an issue. 5. Nick Cooper Answers Notwithstanding the fact that the UK was one of the pioneers of naval aviation, and certainly was building aircraft carriers before the United States, the countries have different needs and reasons for operating carriers. The UK also doesn't want to operate nuclear-powered carriers, and if it did it would still probably design its own, just as the French have done. A lesson from history. 
British aircraft carriers had armoured steel flight decks. Any kamikaze targeting one of the carriers of the British Pacific Fleet, yes, there was such a thing, effectively bounced off. The sailors simply washed off the debris, and quickly carried on launching and recovering aircraft. American aircraft carriers had wooden flight decks. Any kamikaze targeting one of the carriers of the American Pacific Fleet often went through them, and or setting them on fire. One such hit could easily put an end to the launching and recovery of aircraft until time-consuming repairs had been carried out. And you think the British should have been taking design cues from the Americans?